reflection on AI camp and a few announcements. AI camp with the mission of make AI available to all developers is a global online AI platform for developers, data scientists to learn and practice AI technology by online tech talks, workshops, boot camps, and crash courses. Most of our events, tech talk learning are online. Sometimes we do host in-person uh, events uh, in various cities around the world. Our goal is to enable everyone to learn AI from anywhere, anytime. We are one of the largest AI tech com uh, communities with more than 85 sound developers in the group. We also have local study groups in 40 cities from more than 10 countries. We have hosted more than 500 tech meetups, webinars, boot camps, workshops, and also a large technology conference, AI NextCon, around the world. For the coming week, we have a few tech talks. Uh, you can take a look at the website or on the web uh, on slides. Uh, we have quite a few uh, events in the coming week. We have the automail from uh, Salesforce and deep learning on mobile device uh, from NVIDIA and uh, a Facebook tech talk on machine learning compiler and runtime. Um, and another speakers from LinkedIn talk about data streams infrastructure. Uh, so it's great, a lot of talk, uh, best practice. Um, and if you want to uh, share our talks on our platform, uh, you can submit your talk topics. Uh, we can uh, review and get it arranged. Speaking about the uh, global technology communities, uh, we, are, we have more than 40 cities uh, AI learning groups in uh, around the world. So we also have the local chapter programs. Uh, we are calling for uh, volunteers, uh, chapter leaders uh, that uh, in all these uh, local cities. Uh, so it's a great way to get involved with uh, uh, local technology communities to help to get, uh, developers uh, together to learn and practice AI, machine learning, deep learning. So it's a great way to be involved uh, if you are interested. Uh, you can send us, contact us. Uh, we, we, are, we are building the, uh, the local chapter teams uh, in many cities. And also we have uh, online crash course coming up. Uh, it's deep learning for developers. And from, ne from name, you can see uh, it's very hands-on and uh, target developers to get started on deep learning. Uh, it's a four weeks online a crash course and every Tuesday, Thursday, uh, every session is two hours. Uh, so we learning deep learning by doing many projects. So it's 16 hours total, uh, eight sessions. Uh, it included uh, 10 lectures and uh, tons of hands-on code labs. Uh, we also offer the free trial on the first session um, and also the financial aid and the job referral service is available. So if, if you are interested to learn deep learning, uh, it's a great way to, uh, to get started. Uh, check our website for the details. Today, I'm excited to have Xu Hong Zhang to talk about a data process engine for TensorFlow at LinkedIn. In this talk, he will go over the data processing issues common to many machine learning pipelines and how we solve the problems. Then he will deep dive into the open source tool, Avro to TensorFlow. I'm not sure I pronounced the name correctly anyway. Yes. How it works, its tech, uh, its tech architecture and usage. Xu Hong is a senior software engineer at LinkedIn. His research interests include distributed big data systems and machine learning. He is currently working in the AI Foundation team at LinkedIn and is leading the deep, deep learning effort. Without further ado, let's welcome Xu Hong. Hey, Xu Hong, uh, you can start yeah. whenever you are ready and take it away. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, let me stop my share so you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. So thanks, everyone. So I'm good. So. Everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then I will start the presentation. So thanks for this opportunity to share our uh, deep learning work at LinkedIn. So uh, the first step of our uh, LinkedIn deep learning effort. So 
we need to deal with this kind of data processing issues because traditionally we heavily relying on uh, the tooling we open source called Photon that's based on Spark. We are mostly like traditionally uh, using the structured data, for example, this kind of sparse features. But when TensorFlow comes in, TensorFlow is super flexible, accepting all kinds of features and data. So how can we make a smooth like transition and uh, making our developers also, especially the modelers, uh, like easier to like and uh, spend the most of their time on their modeling instead of this kind of routine data processing work that comes in our able to tap work. So in the first few slides, I will at high level show what is able to tap and then show its uh, technical stack and its roles in inside LinkedIn. And uh, yes, so the first one, uh, let's show like uh, what ten, uh, high level what is able to tap. So this is uh, I would say like we want to using able to tap to prepare tensor data. So this is the data preparation. It's not like a one part of your training graph. It's just before your training, you do this data pre-processing. Um, and what it do is like, we, you read in the raw input data, whatever you have right now, and then we have this uh, work to help you to generating some tensor metadata. So if you work with TensorFlow, you know that the data is not like the traditional like data processing engine, for example, Spark, you just read in the data and then do something. But for TensorFlow to read in some training data, tensor metadata is also very important. So we need to collect this kind of metadata and then extract whatever features you want to do the training and then finally upload them to either AVR or TF record based training data. That's high level what AVR to TF is doing. And then I will introduce some details, giving some examples, so how to use able to TF. And uh, yes, so let's continue. Like, uh, so where does able to TF sit at the LinkedIn like TensorFlow developing stack? So we will, uh, so one important thing we 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 have uh, we noted uh, we started this uh, deep learning effort at, inside LinkedIn is our infrastructure is heavily based on Yarn. And that means we initially cannot schedule our TensorFlow this kind of deep learning jobs on our young cluster. Then our group, we collaborate with our great team to develop this TensorFlow on Yarn. So it's already open sourced. And I would say it's, uh, it's really easy to use. So we can directly use, uh, using your current Hadoop cluster to do this kind of deep learning uh, um, uh, jobs and scheduling. You can request GPU resources. So it's very good. So we're sitting on top of these things. And um, since we are heavily using Spark, so definitely like for large scale data processing, we, we want to develop something tools for TensorFlow that are also based on Spark. And this is compatible with our info. So every TF sits in uh, before all the training jobs and align, uh, sit align with TensorFlow. That's before everything starts, we use this able to tf things to prepare your data. And inside LinkedIn, we also provide many other things that uh, work with together uh, with this able to TF to helping our modelers to easily develop the models. We have this kind of training job launcher and also some pre-trained model templates and some model utility and even notebook. So these kind of things. We haven't open sourced them yet. So I think uh, in the future, we will open, open source all our stack. So able to TF is just our first step. Uh, after introducing the stack, let's show um, the data processing, like a development cycle or the model development pipeline. So you see from the left side, what you have normally is just the raw training data. So what able to tf do here, so you can see this, the first blue box there, that's where able to tf comes in. We want a user to only like specify a training config to specify what features they want to use in their, later in their training and uh, some associated uh, like tensor requirements, what kind of tensor you will want. Then able to tf can convert your raw training data to some tensorized data that's compatible with TensorFlow. And we will generate some tensor metadata. So later on, you can e easily load in them into your TensorFlow programs. Inside of LinkedIn, we also develop this kind of uh, util function. Uh, this is, um, uh, uh, based on TensorFlow APIs, 
but not only a bit uh, in terms of Bolivia. This piece we are working in progress to open source this part. So right now, if you see the web uh, TensorFlow is official uh, data set API, they mainly support TF record, uh, CSV, this kind of format. So for this kind of nested structures, for example, ever this kind of data, you cannot directly read them. So inside LinkedIn, we are trying to open source, uh, merge this into TensorFlow and uh, providing this kind of API. But inside the, uh, LinkedIn, we are already using this. So we wrap around the API, provide a simple one line of function that you only tell us where your data sits and where is the metadata. Then what it will give you is a TensorFlow dataset instance that contains your features and labels. Then you can directly working on your model graph building. So modelers don't really have to spend time on the upper layer. The upper layer is just what you need in input is only just one config file. Then what do you do? Then you can directly working on your model graph building and then start the training and model exporting. So that's our reason here. We want to minimize the effort for the modelers. Then I will go to some details of April 2 tf So the overall steps, what April 2 tf is doing. So as we showed in the last slides, the input to April 2 tf is your raw training data and the April 2 tf config. Later on, we will put a lot of like time on introducing this April to uh, TF config. So we want to develop one high level messages like for engineers, they don't want to know this entering how to deal with data uh, or how to use Spark or even Pig or whatever, this kind of tools. We want to simplify the features just using names or configs. Then people can directly working on their training pipeline. So for the, uh, for the input data, uh, we don't have too much limitations here. As long as Spark can read them into data frame or whatever, something, then we can take them and then output something TensorFlow can read. So the first part definitely is feature extraction. So most of the time you have your training data, but for different models, you want to try out different features. You don't want to use all the data in your training data to do a training for every model. So we provide these kind of things. First step is you only extract the features you want to use later and then do further processing. So that's why this April 2 TF config comes in. So you will specify the features you want to use. And then the second step, after specifying the feature you want to use, we would do some transformations here. Uh, right now, what we do here is only doing some simple like um, um, uh, tokenization or the um, hashing things. But we recommend doing this kind of transformation inside of your training graph. So that's our lessons learned. So you would do some transformation learned here, and then later on when you serve online, it's easy to make this kind of piece inconsistent. So you build all your data processing and this kind of transformation pipeline into the TensorFlow graph is much more safe. That's why we say this uh, feature transformation step is optional. And um, so an another important step is we will collect the feature mappings and generating, generating some tensor metadata. So what is the feature mapping? That's uh, mainly, uh, let's give a very simple example. For example, if you are using a um, text feature, you want to um, tokenize the sentence and convert each word into an ID. That means we need to collect a vocabulary list so that we can convert each token into an ID. Then later, most of the time, we will train an embedding for each word. So that's what is a feature mapping. But this also applies to sparse features and other, other features. So for example, category features, uh, as a LinkedIn, you have your profiles. For example, you have you list many skills. When we want to use these skills as a feature, most of the time we will convert each skill into a number. So that's what, Tinder, what TensorFlow takes in. So we need to collect all kinds of this kind of feature mapping and generate some Tensor metadata. The Tensor metadata mainly composing the cardinality things. For example, how large your vocabulary list because when this kind of cardinality information is useful when you're doing the uh, embedding lookup, when you initialize uh, one uh, embedding variable, so you need to know how many unique uh, vectors you want to train in the embedding matrix. And uh, also, for the next step, when we have this feature mapping, we can do the feature tensorization. This tensorization is, is, is really just about like converting the uh, 
uh, uh, string-based indices into IDs. The ones I mentioned earlier, for example, you want to convert tokens into IDs, want to convert some category features into some ID, numerical IDs. That's the centralization uh, step. So after this one, we will have some uh, data that's directly readable by TensorFlow. So we have one option here. So for, for open source one, we recommend you directly output the data into TF record. So because TensorFlow have this official support for directly loading TF record. So by link, inside LinkedIn, we heavily rely on Avro. So our current default option is Avro. So um, together we will output uh, some Tensor metadata. This is metadata will sit along with your uh, converted this kind of tensorized training data. So after you have these two pieces, you can directly loading them into your tensor flow. Uh, I think in the future, after this kind of uh, able record it set API is open source to tensor flow, we will open, uh, we'll also open source this, uh, this piece. That means it is directly bounded with able to TF. You can use just one little Python function call to get your uh, TensorFlow dataset instance. Um, so after showing how level steps, let's um, look at a very simple example. So on the left side, this is your raw features. And um, so we have uh, re uh, released two feature, uh, two examples here. One is a text feature, for example, called uh, profile summary. This is something, for example, you build right now on LinkedIn and a software engineer working at LinkedIn. So we already tokenized them. We refer them as an array of tokens. So if you see this token is a subfield of the profile summary, you might have some other fields. The another feature is uh, just a traditional category feature I just mentioned earlier, for example, the skills. So internally, we are using this format to represent this kind of category features. If you will use our open source uh, uh, machine learning tooling uh, or library called Photon, we are also using the similar, uh, actually the same structure to representing these sparse features. So the name actually is, is the, the feature name, and uh, the term is actually um, how many, like, uh, for example, in, in skills, how many unique skills you have, and the value basically you can appending some weights here. And uh, so the flexibility of this one, you can, for example, you can put skills and company into one single feature. Sometimes we just learn, for example, a uh, logistic regression. That means we don't want to learn any embeddings, then we can com compact every, all kinds of, like this kind of category kind of features into one giant tensor. So later, you will see after we do the tensorize in April to TF, the data will look like um, in the middle, it will look something like this. So we'll convert each word into an ID. There will be an array of integers or longs. And then, for example, you look at, uh, for the category features, we will represent them into something you are familiar with, that is the sparse tensors. Uh, sparse tensors in uh, TensorFlow, you also have this kind of indices and values. So that's how they, uh, we're representing the sparse features uh, uh, on disk using Avro. So we, the indices here corresponding to your unique name plus term combination and the value is just original values. So the labels is just uh, the same as the others, we just pass through them. After you have this tensorized uh, data, we are able to directly do training on them. Then we will spend some time to look at the config, the able to TF config. So why we want to, as I talked earlier, why I want to do some emphasis on this, that means our a uh, high level goal is we just want users to focus on this kind of simple configs. High, we want to hide in the complexity from them. Then we can uh, uh, like speed up uh, modulars like modeling process. So the first config we look at here is um, the, uh, on the left side is the, uh, the composing blocks of April 2 tf config. So each feature compose two kinds of information, the input feature information and output tensor information. So the input feature information, we just like you to select uh, what kind of features in your raw data you want to use as a feature. So the first example here, we have a column expression 
um, uh, option here that is able for you, uh, able for you to specify some, for example, uh, Spark CQ uh, like uh, expressions to select some uh, columns in your existing data. You want to use that features. This one, as we talked about earlier, you want to use the token subfield inside this um, profile summary column as the feature. Then we just space up them here. Later, you can specify the output tensor information. Basically, what kind of tensors you want to convert these uh, uh, tokens into, and uh, what uh, the tensor names you want to use during training. So um, we have this. Uh, you can also specify this data type. So originally, if you see the tokens is a real strings. If you specify this type as long, that means you want us to convert the tokens into some IDs. We will automatically collect all the um, we automatically collect all the mappings and then do the conversion. The shape here, because the is a negative one, that means it's the arbitrary uh, 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 a real arbitrary length. That means um, for each record, the tokens, the number of tokens can be different. So on the on the right side, we have another config that is for the um, uh, category features we just showed in last slides. For example, the scales. So this is uh, some examples. For example, this column config here, we have a name called member NTV features. This is member name term value features. So uh, just some knowledge here. So in our existing like a LinkedIn. Uh, uh, legacy data, we put many different uh, category features into one one conjunct column. For example, this one in Spark is a one column, and then we put many different category features inside of this column. For example, skills or whatever you put in on, on LinkedIn, something like these kind of features, and we provide this kind of thing for you to extract out some specific features from this kind of giant columns. For example, I'm only interested in the skill feature in this uh, in this uh, column. Then we can extract them out, and then later convert them into a uh, sparse vector. This sparse vector, as we uh, talked earlier, it's just the indices and the values. And you also can give a new name for uh, this thing, uh, for this uh, sparse uh, feature. So another uh, introduction is on the. Uh, some information on the shape. As you see earlier, the output tensor information, you have to specify the shape. So this shape information is aligned with the tensor flow. So if it's a bracket, empty bracket, that means it's a scalar type. And if it's negative one, that means a one year array of any length. And if a uh, uh, bracket with six, that means a one year array with uh, six element. So similar like others, 2D matrix. So this shape information, um, we don't do anything inside uh, like uh, able to tf We just uh, pass through this information. This one will be used uh, during your uh, loading time at uh, TensorFlow. That means we will not do any reshaping inside uh, able to tf uh, able to tf doesn't want to change any of your like a uh, uh, feature, like uh, do, do this kind of restructuring things. We want to keep the original um, shape. So just more information on the category features. So why we want to have this limitation here. So for categories or sparse features, we require them to represent it in name term value format. So um, we so later when this open source project is uh, accepted by most people, we might want to relax this one. But right now, as our first step, this is what we use inside LinkedIn and also what Photon is using. So we are having this assumption. For example, as we talked about earlier, the skills feature, this is a category feature which require you to put them into something like this. So if you have a skill feature, then you put, this is features called a, if you in Spark, there's a top level column. And you want to put, this is an array of name term value tuples. So the name will be skills, the term will be each unique category in your uh, you know, skills and then the values, representing them in this kind of format. So, so for other types, we don't have this kind of limitations. We, for example, we support in long, this kind of, all these kind of primitive types. So we don't have any other limitations. We just require you to prepare your 
uh, have your sparse features into this kind of format. So let's continue on the sensorization process. This I will talk about the feature mapping table generation. So essentially what we are doing is we want to convert uh, stream-based indices into some numerical ID-based indices. So why traditionally we have this stream-based indices? The most, uh, uh, like, um, uh, the primary reason, primary reason is when we have this, um, for example, this kind of representation, this stream-based indices, it's easier for us to, to debug. If you look at our data, we know which feature it is, then we can have a better understanding of our data. I think most, come, uh, similar like your raw tracking data or whatever something, that means you can easily know what this feature is and do simple debugging. After you convert it into something TensorFlow can read, for example, the IDs, then you will lose this kind of meaning. But um, that's why we, most people or most companies will have this kind of stream-based indices. So our, this step is just want to convert them into numerical ID and numerical ID-based indices so that we can do the training uh, inside of TensorFlow. So some, now the first uh, uh, thing we need to notice is this mapping table is only collected on the training data. So that means um, you might have, uh, for example, if you are in your test data or validation data, you might see some unknown categories, for example, skills. During my, uh, in my training data, you will only have 10 skills, but in your test data or validation data, you have more than 10 skills, have some new skills. We will treat all the new ones as unknowns, so have a special token there. So this is, that's something to notice. Mapping table is only on the training data. And the uh, uh, third one is, so sometimes people want to, uh, this mapping table is like, a, I would say it's tightly bounded with the training data, but some people want to have this kind of consistent mapping across like different uh, models or different data sets. Then they can provide their own mapping table. Then able to TF will not collect this uh, table and uh, directly use whatever user specified and then do the, the centralization process. So this is an example of how the mapping table looks like. So consistent with our previous examples for category features requiring, requiring the mapping table written in this kind of format. So each row basically is a combination of name, comma, term. So for example, in the skills, you have a list of skill Python. This is one and entry. So this corresponds, they will, so each entry will be mapped to an ID. Just for, for inside April 2 TF, we just map, map the first line starting from index zero. And so why we want to do this, we are, why we are repeating these names. We want to have this flexibility. For example, if you want to put another feature together with these skills, for example, company, you can continue to append, uh, for example, company, Google, company, Facebook, inside these mapping files. Then we will convert uh, um, these uh, spark sensors using this mapping. So that's the flexibility here. And another example is just, for example, the, uh, uh, the text features. We just list each word uh, for each line. Then this is a vocabulary list. This is, should be similar if you're working on any NLP task. So most of the uh, vocabularies are listed in using this way. And uh, some uh, more information on the cardinality things, I, even though I have introduced a bit earlier. So I want to highlight uh, what, what does cardinality mean in, for different kind of features. For sparse vectors or category features, the cardin cardinality means the unique number of name plus term across all the records. So that, that basically this means, for example, the skills, that means all the unique number of skills in across all of your records. If you, if you have a uh, feature that combines both skills and a company, that means all the unique uh, company uh, and uh, unique skills in your all your records. For the strings, for the mappings, for example, the vocabularies, basically all the unique number of strings or if you're using the text feature, all the unique number of words or tokens across all your records. 
for long or integer type, we think the we regard the uh, cardinality as the maximum value of the integer or long value. So basically, we will output this kind of information in, in the metadata. Then you can utilize this later when we're building your model graph. So just to show an uh, instance like um, what a sparse uh, feature looks like when we serialize them to disk after we finish the conservation process, we dump them into uh, HDFS. So something we need to take a special look at is the sparse vector and what is sparse vector. So this is exactly the same as the signature flow. We have the indices and the values. Just um, uh, and now for other types, we direct, just directly output them so it's similar like what you see right now, the integer is long, floats, whatever is supported by TensorFlow. So after introducing all of this, I will detail more examples on the config side. So this is small, like about how to use April 2 tf So the first one we want to show is something. So we will focus on two things. First, look at what's your in input feature. What, what, is, what is it? And then We'll look at the output center information, see how we do this kind of centralization things. So the first example is, if you originally have a text column, that is raw string type, this is the text, and later you want to use whatever it is. For example, right now many pre-training embedding can directly affect a sentence and then output the embedding for this sentence. Then what you need to put into output center information, you need to tell us that, okay, this uh, one to that is featured the name as profile summary and the D type as string. That means it's keeping its original type. The shape is just a scalar type. So that means we will keep the original string into a final tensor. We will do nothing, just simply extract out this, this feature and uh, dump it to the final result. So for the second ones, as we showed earlier, if you already have some tokens and and you don't want to do this kind of mapping, converting in, converting each token into an ID, then you have to tell us the D type has to be strings. That means we know you want to keep the original D type, then we will not do any this kind of mapping conversion things. And it will tell us the shape. This is a, a feature a array with arbitrary lengths. So another thing is, if you uh, continue on the profile summary thing, you have the tokens, but later on you want to use them as IDs and then train a embedding on top of them, then you need to tell us the D type is long. As long as we identify the D type change and of string too long, then, then we know that we want to collect in this kind of mapping table and do the conversion for you. So another one is uh, very common, just like uh, what we already have. So suppose you already have some very good embeddings for whatever kind of features, just here so, uh, for member, just for them we have some embedding. The embedding is just a uh, real float. So we can, you can directly specify in this column and then what we do is directly passing through this field. So there's no conversion here. So this kind of dense vectors uh, embedding type is already ready to be used by TensorFlow. So we're directly supporting path through them. So another type is uh, definitely the labels. So whatever labels you have, is uh, if the scalar type is directly, directly put it here. So there's nothing special here. So then we will see, uh, uh, take a look at what the tensor metadata looks like. So after showing the, the, all the examples, this is what are the, the output will be looks like, the tensor metadata. So if you, can, if you look at this uh, metadata, we divide them into two top level um, columns. One is the features, the other one is the labels. So these features is, it will be the, uh, exactly the corresponding the ones if you have used the TensorFlow estimator function, if you see their model function corresponding to two parameters, features and labels. This is exactly the features and labels you will see. This is a metadata, metadata information for these tensors. So you, here we contain their names, you specify the label to TF config, and then it's D type and the shape. And the cardinality, some ones have cardinality, some one doesn't have. If it doesn't have, we just put an out there. So with all this kind of metadata here, you can do you can easily like utilize this metadata and, and loading the 
the data dumped by April to tap into TensorFlow. Inside, inside LinkedIn, we are already providing a simple tools. So directly taking in this metadata and the, the, uh, the, 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 up, the location of the able to TF output, then we can give you a, a data set instances. So I think that should be all that I will cover for today. And uh, we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. Thank you. Great. So um, we have quite a few questions. Can you yes. see them? Uh, some of it is in the Q&A, some of them in the chat window. Uh, yes, let me try. Uh, I will first look at the Q&A. Right? Okay, yeah. Okay. So can you talk a bit about yarn, why it is, why it is used over something like uh, Kubernetes or other schedulers. Uh, okay, so Yarn, we are not, uh, Kubernetes, I, I think it's different from Yarn. We are not, um, this kind of, uh, I think Yarn and uh, Kubernetes are not something that you can mix them together. You, you're either using Yarn or Kubernetes to schedule your uh, uh, hardware resources. Um, inside LinkedIn, we are not using Kubernetes yet. So we have it relying on Hadoop and Spark, this kind of yarn-based uh, uh, framework. And then we developed this uh, TensorFlow on yarn, this kind of scheduling for TensorFlow. So yeah, that's for the first question. I don't have experience of using yarn on Kubernetes. Yes, basically we treat yarn and uh, Kubernetes as uh, 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 the, same, uh, the same position. Uh, so can you, can any arbitrary input data, uh, any arbitrary input that can be tenterized? Yes, I would say yes. So the only limitation we, like at uh, least earlier, is uh, we have a special requirement for the sparse features. You have to represent representing them into something like the name term, name term value format. So other than that, so all other features should be supported. Yeah, so if there is something we cannot support, Definitely, like you are welcome to um, give some pull requests or some comments on our GitHub. We will consider to incorporating incorporating them. Yes, that's for this question. So another question is: Have you looked at Apache Arrow? How that fit into this use case of covering converting between data formats? Yes, I I have uh, have I know all this uh, uh, Apache uh, Arrow. That basically, this is. Uh, basically sharing some data across uh, in-memory in data across different uh, uh, engines. So what Avro 2 tf is doing here is not only like uh, converting um, a different format. So one important thing I would say is collecting the, ma the metadata, the, the mapping things. So definitely Avro 2 tf can um, play some role here. I think this is not like, um, should be some orth orthogonal things. We can Put Avro to tap, uh, like uh, work with uh, Apache Avro things. We can just, for example, if you have some data, we can use Avro to tf convert to some data, and then put it to Apache Avro. Then, then TensorFlow and other framework can share this kind of tensorize the data. So, I, yeah, I think this should be some orthogonal uh, framework. Yeah, that's for this answer. So uh, another question is, can we get the slice stack? to look deep into this. Oh, the basically want to sh me to share these slides. I think it should be okay, I can share these slides. Yeah, I will talk to Bill how to share these slides. Oh, next question, if not using the Kubernetes, how are you managing the containers? Okay, so, uh, so Yarn, Yarn basically is also, uh, you have worked with uh, like uh, using Hadoop or Spark, Yarn is basically, it's also scheduling these containers. It's just these containers is not the same as like, um, for example, Docker things. It's um, specially, specially utilized by Yarn. It's still a container like the uh, infrastructure. It's just that this container doesn't have that much, much flexibility. For example, we cannot provide your own image, these kind of things. It's just used by Yarn itself. 
Uh, so yeah, we are not using Kubernetes. So we are already able to schedule this kind of containers. And then we build another TensorFlow on Yarn, this kind of scheduling framework, so that we can allocate containers, especially the GPU can, uh, container, uh, GPU resources to the containers and then give it to the TensorFlow jobs. So Yarn traditionally tentatively bounded with uh, Hadoop and uh, Spark. Is if you want to run TensorFlow jobs, it's not like straightforward. You have to develop something using some tools, for example, TensorFlow Yarn, Tony, these kind of things. Uh, if you're interested, please do look at, uh, take a look at TensorFlow on Yarn. I know many companies are still using Yarn-based uh, infrastructure. And I think uh, Google Cloud is also trying to incorporate in TensorFlow on Yarn. So welcome to take a look at that. Yes, this is, that's it for this question. Another question, every, any reason of using Avro, no other formats like uh, Swift or uh, Protobuf? Yes. So uh, Avro, it's not a, like a particular reason. It's like inside LinkedIn, we have a long history of using Avro. Um, but uh, uh, there's no particular reason, I think. It's just different companies have their history. They have different, uh, this kind of stack. Um, but uh, for Avro to TF, it's just uh, our name like this. But actually, we can read in any uh, data that Spark can read. The output can be either TF record or Avro. Uh, t um, why we want to up uh, the output? Why we want to have this option uploaded to Avro? Because we are going going to open source one dataset API on this Avro format uh, data. So officially, TensorFlow support TF, TF record. Uh, TF record is basically per, uh, per, protocol buff, protocol buff. So you can directly using these API, APIs now. So this is for this question. So the next question is: What do you think about Uber's uh, uh, Peloton scheduler. Um, actually, I don't have knowledge on this scheduler. Uh, I, I cannot answer this question, but I definitely it's good to take a, to know this and I will take a look at this scheduler offline. Thank you. So there are, are there any other questions on the, on the channel? Um. You can take a look. I think most of them are already covered by the, uh, you already answered. Uh, let's just quickly go to the chat window to see if any, see we miss. Okay, chat window. Uh, I think there are when it said, what is the public library used to convert a software to two and an engineer to nine? Oh, is this question related? I'm not sure. Uh, convert into near a uh, near line. No, it's uh, used to convert a software to two and engineer to nine. What is a public library okay. to, convert to convert software to two? Software and to two. I think it talked yeah. about uh, convert the category number to some uh, numerical. I'm not sure the questions, but. Uh, Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I think it should be related to one example that I put here. So a problem. I think how to convert, the, for example, this software is one token in the uh, in my the, in the vocabulary. Then we convert it into the ID and two and a nine. The public libraries. I don't think there is a public library as long as you have a mapping file can do whatever thing. For example, just a, inside the uh, Spark or you just using hash map for loading the the mapping file and then convert each one as a uh, uh, indices as ID. That should be, I think uh, if I understand this question correctly. Okay, so another question we can scroll a little bit. So do you, you have used a uh, oh. Yeah, I think there's uh, some misunderstandings. So actually, we are not converting some strings for into like the um, if you have a number represented using a string and then convert into a number. That's not how it works. What we do is like we collect a, a mapping file for all the strings and then map it to a integer. It's not like the ones we we uh, you have a, a string literal that that is number and then convert it. It's not that that, that kind of things. 
So what is the appearance with the requirements for distributed tensor flow? Does the data need to be partitioned in any particular way? Okay, so um, for distributed tensor flow, yes, data, data loading this, uh, and this, because right now the most popular ones for tensor flow distributed training is uh, data kernel, data parallelism, yes. So we need many machines to parallel loading this data. I think IO is actually one of the um, bottleneck even though GPU is very fast, but most of the time we are facing these kind of issues. Our data loading phase is uh, too slow. That, uh, so the, in this scenario, if we're loading the data distributedly, that will help a lot. And then the second part, uh, the second question is, does the data need to be partitioned on in any particular way? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be. So uh, for example, uh, April to TF, we just output it to a, to HDFS, so I think most companies are using this kind of similar storage. Even in, in cloud, you have some S3 or some other storage. They say that some distributed storage systems. For TensorFlow, so if you take a look at the data set API, when you are doing the training, data, the data set API can automatically help you to do the sharding for you. So you don't have to pre-partition your data. But um, but uh, if uh, you're already using Spark, this kind of engines, your data is already distributed into multiple nodes. For example, you are not storing the, your training data into one single files. You are actually selecting them into multiple files. Each file is actually partitioning partition into lower level blocks into multiple machines. So that's the benefit of using Yarn. We can schedule like, this kind of uh, TensorFlow training tasks to the machines where the machine host, uh, host is already hosting the data you have. So this is something that we, yeah, I, I think I can mention. Yeah, basically you don't have to worry about these partitioning things. Uh, TensorFlow can do this, Spark also can do this, yes. I think that should be all the question, right? <laughs>